Um, I guess my uh, uh, presentation today will start at the doorstep of Australia and just give you a bit of an update on uh, what's been happening with uh, Chem Clear and Drum Muster. But the main focus is really to provide a canvas of what's happening elsewhere in the world uh, with product stewardship um, and in particular in, in the uh, animal health and, and uh, ag chem sectors uh, which go beyond uh, container management and obsolete stocks. And I think that it's something that organisations such as CropLife Australia and through their affiliation with CropLife International uh, are really making major achievements in terms of how it will contribute to this issue already touched on this morning about feeding the world and the future challenges and the need of, of actually helping developing economies being able to feed themselves. So um, I just uh, the, the opening slide here really is just the picture says a thousand words and this is really showing just how at a grassroots level the transfer of knowledge and training and education is going on in countries throughout South America, uh, Southeast Asia, Africa. Um, but just to give you, I guess, a visual sense of, of how the, what this, this looks like. Um, starting off with uh, what's going on in our backyard, um, Drum Muster started in 1999, so it's a little younger than the Clean Farms uh, program, um, which clearly is a world leader in what it does. Uh, last October, Drum Muster notched up its 18 millionth drum, so it's great to get these milestones, and in fact, overnight, we hit the two millionth drum for 2010-11, last financial year. So uh, it's, it's great to see these things happen, and they happen because everyone gets behind it. The 90 or so manufacturers uh, that are aboard, all the farmers that are aboard, the local government associations. We've got something now around 750 points around rural Australia where people can take their drums back, you can also have collections on farms. We have 80 odd community groups involved. There's a diverse model in which we're hunting out those containers and, and getting them to come back. The other thing too is the amount of support we get from local government. At the moment, something like 3,000 people across Australia are trained in how to inspect the drums in our health and safety management and helping farmers manage this uh, return and recycling process safely. So a lot of advocates for us and they're out there dealing with a whole lot of waste issues as well. Uh, ChemClear um, is uh, started in 2003, so it's uh, st still a younger program in terms of its maturity. So far, around 320 tonnes of uh, obsolete chemicals has been collected, uh, and like New Zealand, it is a complex uh, funding model, but industry does fund it through the drum muster levy, and we also try and get uh, government support as we do collections for, for some of the other chem chemicals and otherwise its user pays. Um, most of those chemicals we're able to use as um, fossil fuel replacements uh, in cement kiln uh, firing, so at very high temperatures and all within um, uh, safe, safe emission limits. Um, and that provides a, a relatively small but still a contribution of uh, savings in greenhouse gases of around 560 tonnes. Uh, where I'm going to turn to next is actually around the um, uh, Queensland floods this time last year, devastating. Uh, Cyclone Yassi as well on top of that. And where we've seen Russell and uh, Graham talking about how stewardship can play a role in, in access to markets and perhaps informing and leading better regulation in terms of product stewardship, our example here in Australia uh, is about working directly with government to bring, um, I guess, a more coordinated um, more cost-effective, more efficient support to communities, particularly in times of natural disasters. So we're uh, just uh, kind of recalling uh, where, we, what we, where we were at probably about this time last year. I do recall being at Abair and um, Wes from Dairy Farmers actually giving his own personal account of how his dairy farm had been affected by the floods and it's still something that I carry the images with me. But it was pretty drastic, uh, the flooding um, and, the, and the cyclone, 70 towns, 200,000 people uh, affected. Um, obviously there was a, a time for a lot of people in farming communities where uh, their ability to earn money had stopped overnight, but there, the massive cleanup had to start. And um, the cost of cleanup, in particular with dealing with chemicals, uh, is, as we've said before, very expensive. 
um, and also the management of that too and making sure that, that where there are stranded uh, chemicals that they are actually in safe containers and, and safely stored. So there's a lot of experience that uh, ChemClear could bring to bear and support to the government cleanup for, for Queensland. And industry through ChemClear, we approached the Queensland government and offered our expertise. We were, we were going to run a collection through Queensland and with their support and their assistance, we could probably deal with the whole the size of the task, if you think about the amount of chemicals that would have been affected, ones that actually normally would have been used uh, but had been damaged through, for, through the uh, natural disasters. So fortunately we were able to work with the Queensland Government and they identified 37 of the worst affected areas uh, for which their funding would be provided um, and then industry also came to the party in terms of funding our own uh, collections through the drum muster levy. So through that collaboration uh, ChemClear, um, through the uh, board, its uh, expertise in terms of managing collections, communicating, uh, working with local government, setting up the sites, running the transportation tasks, scheduling the collection, and in the end, uh, I mean, it was quite a quite a ask. Over seven weeks, we uh, ran through the uh, areas of Queensland that were affected, visited around 65 sites, and uh, in the end. Um, travelled around 13,000 kilometres. Again, to get you a sense of what happened, uh, in the centre there was a, a typical ad that we ran to tell people about what was going on, to tell them that the, this help was coming, that they had funding support from the government. And that's really important because with funding certainty, in a time when you haven't got your business operating, it's a really important thing to be able to make the decision to participate in the collection. Um, so you can see in some of the areas that you've got chemical containers inches, feet wedged into mud. I mean the cleanup, it, 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 it's hard to fathom. But nevertheless in time, uh, as you can see in the other photos and uh, in the bottom there, Lisa Nixon who's with us today, she's the program manager for ChemClear on site there with farmers as they're returning the chemicals. So a, a, a really a large, a large ask but very suitably managed and in the end Something like 53,000 kilograms of damaged waste chemical was taken out of the flood affected areas, which is an important outcome because if you think about the f future impact that might have take, had on the environment if, we, if that had remained there. Um, and over 95% of that had come from primary producers. So it's a really good example of how industry's expertise combined with the resources of the government can bring about coordinated efforts in times of natural disaster. Moving now to looking at what else is happening around the world, I, I'd just like to acknowledge um, Keith Jones from CropLife International. He kindly uh, gave me uh, these slides and information. He would love to be here, but unfortunately wasn't able to make it. Um, this map here is actually just giving you a snapshot of container management programs around the world. The dark green areas are those which are well established and you've heard from a couple today. Uh, I think the interesting uh, part from this is the, the pink and the, and the lighter green areas where you've got new programs and piloted programs and, and countries where uh, it's it, under consideration that uh, programs can be uh, implemented and really the importance this will play in improving um, environmental outcomes in some of those developing economies. Another interesting perspective on what's happening around the world is about how many of these are getting driven through a voluntary approach versus being mandated through regulation. And this table shows that the majority are actually through voluntary approaches. And uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a helpful uh, thing which shows that industry uh, farmers are, are wanting to take responsibility uh, through their own actions. Over the last few years, we've seen a very dramatic increase in the amount of container waste being removed from the environment and uh, recycled. And I think what this is reflecting is not only the spread of countries <coughs> taking, the, um, taking up programs, but also the current programs actually improving their performance as they go along. Obsolete stocks, this map here again shows you where the uh, uh, programs are operating. Interestingly, since uh, in the last 20 years, around uh, 5,000 tonne of obsolete chem farming chemicals have been um, collected through these programs. 
and uh, there's a, a, an ongoing focus now into the African area. Um, and I think uh, this, this is a really important um, leadership because it is about improving the efficiency but also the environmental outcomes and eventually the quality of the um, produce coming from, from these markets. The other area where a lot of work is being done is around responsible use of chemicals and the integrated pest management. And here in Australia, typically this has fallen, uh, responsible use has, has been managed through uh, government supported programs such as ChemCert. But what we're seeing here globally, again, um, through organisations such as CropLife International and, and its affiliates, that industry is taking the lead in developing programs that are actually helping farmers in developing markets to improve their use of chemicals uh, safely and also effectively managing pests. Um, but it's not just about training. The interesting thing here, I think, is that they have to actually, uh, industry needs to work across a range of factors to make sure it works properly overall. We need to have the right regulatory policy settings. So they need to work with local gov governments and regulators around what that might look like. Um, there needs to be equipment and equipment that can be serviced and you get spare parts from. Uh, it's probably something we take for granted a bit here, but a, a key point. Again, the training and education in then how to be um, uh, in user practice, in, in uh, handling chemicals and storage and application, um, but also about attitudes and attitudes ultimately affect behaviour. So in the end, all of this requires a long-term commitment and not just from industry, but from a whole range of people in the supply chain. This map shows that uh, where, where the training programs have been occurring and to date there's been around 1.2 million people trained uh, through the initiatives of CropLife uh, International and its organisations. Um, and uh, the important thing there I think is the focus of where that training has occurred. Most of it has been in 50% uh, in Latin America, um, but also in the Middle East, Africa and in Asia and 76% of that training has actually been focused on uh, farmers and farm workers. So in uh, closing, um, I think the important uh, take out from today is to see the different roles stewardship plays in interacting at a regulatory policy level, in terms of access to markets um, with quality assurance programs, um, a really interesting case study, I think they're presented by Graham, uh, but it's also happening in other uh, countries and globally through Global Gap. And the interesting uh, thought there is in, in terms of what is the role of these uh, assurance programs in the future, will they really become the uh, effective form of regulation because of the incentive to have access to markets may be a greater uh, a driver of behaviour than, than uh, other uh, regulatory tools. Um, and the third and final is where industry can work with government to bring a, about coordinated public um, uh, support and, and help bring that public good in uh, addressing impacts on the environment that might either come through natural disaster or other, other factors. The benefits of doing this is in all cases, industry's expertise is being leveraged to bring outcomes, relying on that great pool of knowledge that lies within industry that they can bring to bear to bring better outcomes. The assurance uh, programs are there, but they greatly benefit from the linkages that things like ag recovery is provided between the actual farmer at the farm gate, what they do on farm, and meeting those assurance um, uh, standards. There's a reduced burden on, the pub on public resources, whether it be taxpayer funds or whether in fact just by sh the sheer weight of having people available and being able to deliver services. Um, and in the end, through this collaboration and in seeing how stewardship can extend policy and it can enhance uh, uh, quality insurance outcomes, that in the end the community benefits not only from better health and environment outcomes but also better produce and greater certainty and consumer choice um, through the work of industry taking responsibility for the whole of its life cycle of its products. Thank you. <laughs>